when I was ordained, I was 26 years old, one of the things I started to, to do was to officiate at marriages and have to give a homily at a marriage. And I found this kind of a little odd and, and, and made me a little anxious because I didn't know anything about marriage. I was completely clueless about marriage. And here I am giving a homily at a wedding. And I was thinking to myself, like, surely in a situation like this, you know, we could get a married man who's been married for 30, 40 years, or a married woman, you know, let them talk about marriage. You know, they know the realities of marriage. And I thought, well, maybe that might not be the best idea either, you know? They say ignorance is bliss, you know? I mean, they'll learn about the reality of marriage pretty soon, you know? Maybe we can just leave the marriage wedding as a joyful celebration. Anyways, in the first reading, we hear about the Lord putting Adam into a deep sleep and then taking one of Adam's ribs and from that rib creating woman. And this, of course, comes from Scripture, but there's also kind of extra biblical sources that we usually don't take too seriously, but, you know, they kind of give us some, some, some ideas. There's the story of after God created Adam and Eve, Eve noticed Adam was becoming a little distant, a little distracted, and she got a little concerned and even suspicious. So one night, Adam woke up, and it's like someone was tickling his side, and he noticed that Eve was kind of touching his, 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 his side. And he, he said to her, Eve, what are you doing? And she said, I'm counting your ribs. He said, why are you counting my ribs? She said, I'm trying to figure out if there's another woman. <laughs> so anyways, I'm not sure if that story is to be taken seriously, but that's, that's the way the story goes. When Jesus was asked about divorce in the gospel today, which is a common question, everyone's got their opinion on that, of course, Jesus answers by going super deep. Kind of like when you're in a boat, you know, sometimes you know, you're, you're on a body of water and you go from like four feet of water all of a sudden to like a hundred feet of water. You just suddenly, suddenly you just go deep. And that's what the Lord Jesus is doing. When he's asked about marriage and divorce, he answers by saying, that's not the way it was in the beginning. Like he goes to the beginning and speaks about Adam and Eve being made to be one. He's saying God makes husband and wife one flesh. They become one, as it was in the beginning. And if we look at the, the beginning, the first words of sacred scripture, Genesis, it says, in the beginning, God. And we know as we read on in scripture, that God is love. God is love. And as we continue to read, we discover that God is a, is a union of love, a holy trinity, the holy trinity, this divine exchange of love, this perfect unity, so perfectly one that, that there's nothing, no separation, perfectly one yet a unity of three persons, this, this exchange, this unity of love. And we know that man was made in the image and likeness of God. And that's why some interpreters, they say when, when the Lord says, it is not good for man to be alone, speaking of Adam being alone, one interpretation of that is that God alone is good. And he's creating man in his image and likeness. And it's not good. It's not, you could say, God yet. There's, there's, there's not the fullness of the imaging of God until man, in the inclusive sense, becomes a communion of love. And so God creates Eve. And now we have two. We have Adam, Eve. We have husband, wife, male, female. And the mystery is 
just as with the Holy Trinity, this mystery of love, the, the love of the Father being poured into the Son, the love of the Son being re received and reciprocated, poured into the Father eternally, the spiration of love, this love between the Father and the Son, so real that He's a person, the person of the Holy Spirit. So in the Trinity, one plus one equals three. And so too, man, in the inclusive sense, we have husband and wife, male and female, one plus one, that exchange of love, that, that, that mutual giving and receiving uh, embrace of love is so real that nine months la later, you give it a name. It's a person. And so you see how man, and again, in the inclusive sense, imaging God really isn't just Adam out there on his own. It's this wonderful communion of love, this equality, man, woman, equal, pouring love, their love out, receiving love in such a real way that it's fruitful, that it gives life, just as the Holy Spirit emanates from the Father and the Son, pouring out life. And Jesus, our Lord Jesus, he points to this mystery, to this truth, when discussing the, the topic of marriage. When we speak of marriage, again, we're always looking to the Holy Trinity, to, to God, because we're, we, we're the image and likeness of God. The love between the persons of the Trinity, between the Father and the Son giving life, the Holy Spirit, is reflected, is paralleled in the love between husband and wife in marriage. In marriage, love must be free. You can't take a lady at gunpoint and say, you're going to marry me. If you were to do that, you'd get a real quick annulment. That's not a true marriage. Both parties have to come freely. And so too, and for all of eternity, God wants us with Him in heaven, united to Him, but He doesn't force anyone to go to heaven. Love, the married love, the Trinity love, it's, it's free. So there's four things. Free, it's total. God doesn't hold anything back. He holds nothing in reserve when He loves. And so too marriage. It's total. No conditions. No strings attached. Free. Total. It's faithful. In the beginning, God. God is love. God's love is everlasting. God's love endures forever. And so too married love. It's forever. It's everlasting. Again, imaging the love of the Trinity. Free, total, faithful. And it's fruitful. You know, the love between husband and wife open to life, to children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and so on. And, and again, the fruitfulness of this love even goes beyond, you know, children. It's also, you know, the, the ways they serve others, um, maybe the ministries they do, uh, things like that. And so lives can be tremendously fruitful, uh, but again, in marriage, in a particular way, through, through children. Now, it's so important for us to see this. Again, when Jesus is asked about divorce, he goes deep. But he wants us to understand this mystery of who we are. And so, what should happen to us as we ponder God's Word, and, and also, uh, how many of you are familiar of St. John Paul II's teaching of the theology of the body? Have you, any of you heard of that? Many of you, yes. Yeah, so, you know, it's important for us to, to learn about the mystery of, of our identity as, as children of God. And as we do this, we're supposed to see. I see God. You know, some people, they, they wonder, well, what's God like? Is He mad at me? Does He really love me? Does God exist? And, and, and so on. And for me, for people who are struggling with the reality of God, one of the simplest answers is go look at a mother with her child, her newborn child holding her. Look at that love. There's God. That's God right there. That's an image. Because remember, creation reflects 
the Creator. Or I love to see dads with their little children. You know, maybe a child uh, jumping on the father's lap and playing with his face, maybe pulling his beard, and the father filled with love and delight, and the child delighting in his father. That's God. I see God. I see God or, or, or grandparents. Because again, the love between husband and wife, which is meant to, to be uh, fruitful in so many ways, it's kind of like a cascade. You know, if water comes out the side of a mountain, a spring, an inexhaustible spring from a deep source comes out of the mountain, it begins to cascade, it begins to, to divide and, and get bigger and, and bigger. Divide not in the negative sense, but in the, in the, it's spread to diffuse. And all of a sudden you have this beautiful cascading waterfall with all these rivulets. That is what's meant to happen in the imaging of God, in the oneness, the union of husband and wife, children and grandchildren, and, and helping others, and siblings playing together, and, 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 and grandparents, and, and, and birthday parties, and, and Christmas uh, celebrations, all of the, the, this beautiful effusion of love, which we also see in the consecrated life, of course. You think of Father Bob Bedard, filled with the love of God, lived a union with God which was fruitful. So many fruits of Father Bob's life and love with God that flowed through him through the Spirit, we see. As a matter of fact, when I was 17 years old, I came to St. Mary's Parish. I heard Father Bob preach. I met him. And I was inspired to join his community, the Companions of the Cross. Now, many years later, I'm the guy in the pulpit now hopefully speaking about the love of God, letting this love dif be diffusive. And so again, the consecrated life too is meant, meant to, to be diffusive like a, like a cascade. And, and again, as we grow in the spiritual life and as we ponder God's mysteries and his word, the Lord gives us eyes to see this. We see things differently. And I find myself, like as I get older, I just, things touch me more, you know, like a, what's the expression? I'm getting sentimental in my old age. You know, I'll see an elderly couple, a husband and wife, walking together, holding hands through the park, and I'm just like, oh, I, I, I'm, I'm moved. You know, I see children playing. I see, especially when I see a father with his child, a mother with her child, a husband and wife together with a newborn. I'm just like, I see God. I see God, this is beautiful, this is it, this is all the theology and philosophy you need. I don't know, I don't know if you guys, d d does anyone have that similar experience? Nobody? Does everyone think I'm weird? More hands are going up, that's fine, I don't care. The Lord wants us to see. And again, part of seeing this, it's important because it, it, it helps us to make the right decisions. It helps us to choose the right path. We know that, again, marriage, the union of man and woman, husband and wife, giving life, this is sacred, this is holy. It's an image of God, and, and with the theology of the body, they always teach, you don't take an image of the Holy Trinity and break it. That would be, that would be a, a defilement. And so we need to, to, to call out, you know, we need to recognize, like, wait a minute, that's not God. When we, think, when we see things introduced, when we th see things promoted, maybe in the media, when we hear new ideologies, we need to be able to recognize that's not God. That's not God. That's not how it was in the beginning. That's not God's design, his imaging of his, of his great love. Now, when we... When we are given clarity. Our Lord Jesus, as we heard in the gospel when he was asked about divorce, the Lord Jesus, he gives us clarity. He doesn't give us clarity so that we can throw stones at people. When the woman who was caught in adultery was thrown at the feet of Jesus, Jesus didn't throw stones at her. He didn't tell people to, to, to throw stones at her. He forgave her. He was merciful to her. And we too, we need to be merciful. The Lord Jesus, why does he give us clarity? He gives us clarity because he wants us to know 
the truth. Do you want to know the truth? Jesus wants us to know the truth so that we can have life. And what is the truth? The truth is, again, the union of man and woman begetting life, that's an image of the Trinity. And anything else is a defilement. You could say it's an abomination. Sex outside marriage, it's an abomination. When we look at God's design, His plan, it's wrong. Pornography, it's an abomination. That's what it is. Adultery, adultery is an abomination. Entertaining adulterous thoughts, it's an abomination, it's wrong. Contraception, closing love to life is an abomination. Trying to redefine marriage, it's an abomination. It's taking this imaging, this beautiful, life-giving imaging of the Holy Trinity of God, and it's defiling it. And it's important for us, again, to not be afraid, like Jesus, to speak the truth. Again, not in condemnation, not throwing stones at people, in love, but with clarity. Marriage is sacred, it's holy, it's beautiful, it's the imaging of God. We should never be ashamed of defending marriage. We should never stop defending marriage.